Okay. <laughs> Our next talk is numerical air quality modeling systems. Uh, our two speakers will explain to us how scientific methods can be used to model the quality of um, pollution or for air quality in general. Uh, our speakers are Martin Ramacher. Uh, he is with the Helmholtz Centrum for uh, Hirion and his main research subject is the um, exposure of pollution and concentrations. And um, on, his, um, on his left, there is Johannes Bieser. Main research interest is the meta transport of, in the ecosystem. Um, and he's with the Helmholtz Institute as well. Please welcome them both with a huge round of applause. Check, check. Ah, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi. We are Johannes Bieser and Otto Paul. And today we will take you on a journey um, on numerical air quality modeling systems from emission to exposure. Actually, we realized that it's more like a roller coaster ride because uh, there are so many topics that we have to cover that um, we need to be really quick and it will be bumpy. But the idea is that after our presentation, you have a general understanding of what we are doing, why this is important, uh, what are state-of-the-art concepts and applications, and what it can bring for the future. So let's dive into it. Um, we will cover all of these topics. We will talk about air pollution, where it comes from, why is it important, measurements. Then, of course, the numerical air quality modeling systems, applications, exposure. We have a little finale, and then you can ask us anything if there's still time left. So we dive right into the first topic, which is air pollution, and we will start with a little lesson in history. So this is a picture of the Great Smog of London in 1952. And as you can see, you can't see shit. It's very foggy, so uh, this is basically the smog that happened. And it happened because um, it was winter, it was cold, there was not much wind, and on top of it, literally, there was a warm layer of air. So if you have a warm layer of air on top of a cold layer of air, you have something we call inversion in meteorology, and that means basically that all the emissions are trapped below this warm layer of air. So we have all these pollutants trapped inside, and what happened here was that there was lots of coal burning, so people burned coal to heat their houses and for industry, and this resulted in smog. Uh, as a result of this smog, many people died. So um, there are some estimates from 20, 2009 from the UK Met Office that correlated the, the smoke that happened to uh, the deaths that occurred during these days, which you can see here on the left, and the actual numbers are estimates of 10 to 12,000 people that died due to smog. And many more got sick. But the big question here, of course, is what is smog? Because smog can be a lot that looks like smog or fog. Um, and in this particular case, we are talking about winter smog, which I said it already, due to the burning of coal, there were a lot of emissions, and in particular, these were emissions of sulfur dioxide. So you see here SO2, sulfur dioxide. Keep that in mind, because we will have all these little um, pictures of the, the pollutants. We will have them reappearing in the presentation often. So. There was sulfur dioxide and there was particulate matter. But that was not everything, because both of these are in high concentrations already toxic, but what happened here was that also the air was saturated with water, so we had a lot of high humidity and a lot of sulfur dioxide, and in combination this leads to the formation of sulfuric acid, and as the term acid says already, it's acidic, so it's, you shouldn't breathe it, it's just it's dangerous for your health. Um, Another thing that happened during the 1950s were situations like this uh, in Los Angeles. So you had this um, also smog again, but that's a different kind of smog. Because this happens when there's a lot of sunlight, when you have cars and uh, industry and also trees, all of these are emitting lots of substances. And in combination with sun, again, you have the formation of smog. And if you breathe it, it's dangerous for your health. Actually, it's so dangerous that you are gathering with your friends in basements wearing gas masks and asking yourself, what is this smog? And as I said it already, in this case, it's summer smog. So summer smog is basically a product of nitrogen dioxide, which is mainly happening due to combustion in cars, but also in industry and other combustion sources, uh, plus volatile organic compounds, which is actually a huge range of 
compounds, which um, Bisa will introduce to, to you later. And under the influence of sunlight, you have the formation of ozone, and ozone in high concentration is toxic and can endanger your health. So as a result of these events and many other events around the globe, there have been some clean air acts, so-called. And the first one was in 1956. That was a direct consequence of the smog in London. And it was a milestone in legislatory air quality regulation or regulation of such things in general. Um, and some of these measures, like regulation of fuels and smoke-free zones, are still measures, measures that we are applying today to regulate air pollution. Um, in 1970, there was the uh, US Clean Air Act, and at the same time, there was also the establishment of United States Environmental Protection Agency. That's not a coincidence. And today, uh, the, the EPA does a lot of other things and not just regulating air quality. So very two important uh, acts that happen in history uh, with respect to air pollution. So when I talk about regulating air pollution, we are we can come from two different perspectives here. Uh, we have, for example, the, the guideline values, which are international guideline values. These are concentration limits or values that you should not exceed because they endanger your health. And this is based on many studies that were gathered by the WHO. It was last updated a couple of years ago, and it's actually, um, yeah, it's, it's a guideline value. So we shouldn't exceed these values. Then there are limit values. For example, the limit values which are uh, established in the European Union by European Commission, they, orient they are orienting them um, along with the WHO values, but as you can see, they were last updated in 2008. Currently, they are under revision, but the existing limit values we have right now are way higher compared to the ones we have from the WHO. Nevertheless, these Limit and guideline values are a success story because if you look, for example, what's happening in the European Union with the population in urban areas for SO2, you can see that less than 1% of the population living in urban areas is exposed to values of SO2 considered to be dangerous for your health today or in 2021. But for other pollutants, you can see a clear difference between uh, what's, what's going on because you have here particles in different sizes. You have ozone and you have NO2. And if you apply the limit values by the EU, they are still a problem for particles and ozone. But if you apply the guideline values by WHO, it looks like we have a problem almost everywhere. And this is just this thing that the European Commission values are not updated for a long time. They are envisioned right now and they will follow probably the WHO values, but they will probably not be as strict as the WHO values. Although, if this is a success story, um, if we look in other regions in the world, like where there's no such um, regulation, for example, here in Kazakhstan, you can see very well we have winter, we have smog, and this is what I what talked about before. This is the so-called inversion. So the clear sky above is warmer. There's warm air masses. Below we have cold air masses. Everything's trapped inside, so it's, you don't want to be there. Same thing in China. Sometimes smog occurs. So there are many regions in the world where this is still a big problem. But not only in other regions. Coming back to London, we also um, had something very unique again in London. There was a ruling um, that a nine-year-old girl from, from Lewisham in South London, she died in 2013 as a direct result of air pollution. And this ruling stated that air pollution made a material contribution to her death. So there was the first ruling of that kind ever, and I think this introduces a new, yeah, new way of dealing um, with air pollution. If we go back from the individual to the global perspective, Today, air pollution is considered to be one of the world's largest environmental health threats, accounting for 7 million deaths around the world every year by the WHO. And 4.6 million are attrib attributable to uh, ambient air pollution. So I, I guess we, we can settle that we have a big problem here that we should start to tackle. And actually, uh, there's a lot of work to do. Work, and work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and um, the thing is, most of the time, the idea is you can only manage what you can measure. So we need measurements. How are these measurements done for regulatory uh, purposes? So there are these regulatory measurement networks, and what you can see here is um, an example of such a classic air monitoring station that is used for such purposes in essence and measuring the urban background. 
These um, containers, they look more or less the same everywhere. Probably you, if you're from Hamburg, you have seen some of them. They look similar. It's always a container, and there's a lot of equipment inside, which is standard equipment. It's calibrated and maintained, and these equipments cost more than 100,000 euros, so it's very expensive to do that. But they measure more than 20 pollutants continuously, so it's quite good to have these to get an idea of what's the air quality situation like. For example, in Europe. Here you see the network, the European Air Quality Monitoring Network, by the European Environment Agency, and these are results for PM2.5. Um, the dots are measurement stations measuring an annual mean, which is displayed here, and on the first side it looks like um, we have a good spatial coverage, so we get an idea of what's going on here. But imagine each of these points is one station, and the size with respect to the scale of the map, you can get an idea, okay, there's lots of space in between. So if you zoom in, you see all of these measurement stations are far away. Sometimes they are even that far away that the data comes from Brandenburg, and is instead of searching for internet, searching for, for air quality uh, measurements but can't find them. Um, so what I want to say here is the coverage of measurements is sometimes really sparse. So we need more measurements to fill all these gaps, for example. Um, I will skip this one. So what can help here is, for example, do it yourself and low-cost sensor networks. And I'm pretty sure, or I hope, that some of you in this room are dealing with this topic because I would like to get in touch with you. Uh, there are many different networks, I just named some of them, Sensor Community, Former, Luftdaten Info, um, Luftdaten AT, Open Air Cologne and so on. And we did a little study for Hamburg where we wanted to evaluate um, some modeling we did, which I will also show later, but just to get an idea of the spatial coverage in Hamburg, you see here all these dots are measurement stations where these, um, these measurement pipes are located and they are giving us um, yeah, values into a database of PM2.5. So it's, it's really useful to use this to get um, the spatial distribution of the pollutant concentrations in a city like Hamburg better. So it's, it's really an update compared to the 16 measurement stations we have um, officially here in Hamburg. What's kind of a problem is um, the quality of the sensors, but there's lots of stuff going on to, to improve the quality with some algorithms. And what is also sometimes a problem is the temporal coverage. So not all of these sensors are really recording the entire year, but some of them have some, some data gaps that we need to fill in. But anyway, it's very useful to have these measurements. Um, coming back to the global scale, we have here a screenshot of the World Air Quality Index project, and actually they are gathering all of the measurements available. I think this is the most comprehensive database um, I know, which is accessible all the time online, and you, if you zoom in, you see all the low-cost sensors, you see the official monitoring sites, you see everything, so it's very nice. But what you can also see on the first side is that we have global north bias. So US covered well, China, India, that's all fine, and Japan, and Europe, and Australia, there are also some measurement stations, but like South America and Africa, okay, Siberia too, but uh, we have some, some gaps here which should be filled. Um, yeah, so coming to an end for measurements or observations, they are still the gold standard uh, when we talk about high-end instruments. The problem is just that they are very expensive, um, because of technology, calibration, operation, maintenance, but they are highly reliable and compatible. Problems or things that we could improve are the limited spatial and temporal coverage. So as I said, there's a global north bias especially, and then for the high-end instruments. Uh, here, do-it-yourself sensors can work. The problem is also that we can only measure what happened and what happens, so we can't predict the future with measurements, not yet. Not that I know. And we also have very limited source, source apportionment capabilities. Which is also um, a problem is that these measurements, they have detection limits. So if you have very low concentrations, it's hard to measure it. And also we have errors which are connected with measurements. And these can deviate from the true values. And with this, I would like to welcome you to the model. <laughs> Welcome to the model. <laughs> you made it here. I'm amazed after Martin told you that we have a problem and 
that we can measure it. I mean, you probably think, what, what benefit if I find out if my food is poisoned after I eat it? So wouldn't it be nice to know beforehand? I mean, wouldn't it be nice to know how air pollution is tomorrow or next year or to know what some policy decision or some regulation would actually do once we enact it? And huh, lucky, we can do models. There's just one problem, I mean, with the models is that they're basically all wrong. Um, but sometimes, luckily, they're still useful. And then that's the point where you would start defining what a model is. And that's difficult, because basically anything is a model. Um, really, anything can be a model. So now let's find out which model we actually want to use to answer our question at hand. And our question is that we want a model that has everything from the emission to the exposure. So we need stuff being emitted into the atmosphere. We want things flying through the atmosphere and move. We want them to react and change, become more toxic, less toxic. And then at some point we want to know, is the stuff actually going inside a human? And OK, that's our goal. So as a modeler, of course, we think in the box. Um, not outside the box today, we're in the box. And so we imagine a box where we have these processes. We have stuff coming in, we have chemical reactions, and we have transport, and yeah, maybe more boxes is nice. So we start tiling the planet with boxes, and our atmosphere is basically just a huge bunch of boxes of different sizes. and. Here, just let me deviate a bit on the topic of scale, because it, it really depends what, what do we want to look at. If we want to know, like, the global circulation, how much pollutants come over the Atlantic from the US to Europe, you can use grid cells that have a size of hundreds of kilometers. That works fine. Um, if you want to know something about air pollution in a city, you really need to go to the sub-kilometer scale, where you're 10, 100 meters. Basically, you can see that on this fancy diagram that shows you on the x-axis uh, actual scales distances on the planet, and on the y-axis, you see the characteristic time scales of different physical processes. And so they basically see we're between a few meters to a few hundred kilometers in our grid cells. So let's just say we fill the whole planet with grid cells, and now we want to start modeling. And an air quality modeling system is, is a modeling system because it's basically just a bunch of different models getting thrown in a box and connected to each other. And here we start with the transport. So we want things transporting. So that's in our case, I would call it a hydrodynamic model. It could be an ocean model if we would be interested in pollution in the ocean. But in our case, of course, it's an atmospheric model. And there was a really nice talk on the last Chaos Congress, so if you're interested in um, climate and meteorological modeling, there you can now, if you watch us online, go hop over and come back. Um, it's just these models, we're using them, and we're building upon them, and there's just no time to speak more about them, but in the end, it's just the physics. It's the temperature, it's the pressure, it's the movement, the wind, it's, it's the water, like the rain and the water vapor going around. And um, now here, that, that's where we are in, in 2023. So you see on the, on the left side the original Apollo picture from the 70s, and on the right side uh, a recent one kilometer resolution global atmosphere ocean run with the ICANN model. That's actually the model that's used for the German, by the German Weather Service for the forecast. So you have seen that. And we're really at a point where, personally, it starts being difficult deciding which one is the picture. And um, with that, I can take some breath, get the first mesmerizing video with the subliminal information into you. And so, basically, we now have things moving through the atmosphere. Check, first model is there. So now we want to have stuff coming in. So we need doing emission modeling. And emission modeling is just a nicer way of 
being an accountant of everything, because it's everything emits, nature emits, plants emit, even the planet itself, ge geogenic volcanoes emit. Uh, of course, I mean, we humans are the big emitters with mobility, energy, industry, and agriculture. We're quite a deal, but all those natural sources, a forest might be nice, but in a certain circumstance, it can be an emission source of some pollutant. And then it's not only the pollutant, uh, the, the, the pollutants themselves, but it's also precursors. You, you're not just modeling something that goes in the air, transports. Really, you need to reproduce at least some basic atmospheric chemistry, which means you end up with something in the range of a few tens, dozens of species, of substances, to really being able to do that. And here are the friends again. We keep showing them, so we secretly give you some chemistry lessons without you noticing. Um, those pesky blue things down there, it's basically hundreds of thousands of different carbon chains. So we try to somehow not have hundreds of thousands of different, so we use some estimates. And, um, but that, that's very high level, so how, how do we actually do it? And there we basically have, have the two general approaches. It's coming from the top down or from the bottom up, and basically it's a top down approach is when you have some fancy statistics, like imagine you know exactly how much gasoline was sold in Germany in the last year. You know exactly how much cars have been sold or are registered. And just from those numbers, you can estimate like how much nitrogen oxide, how much carbon monoxide did cars emit in Germany. Then you have this number. And then you start distributing this number into every grid cell, into every time step. Typically emissions, you look at like hourly values. And then at some point from this one estimated value, you come down to, to actually a map. Looks a bit like that. Um, you use some geo-reference data, population data, socioeconomic data sets, unemployment statistics. There's more pigs in Schleswig-Holstein than humans, I found out. Um, yes, really, it's true. And, um, and then you just use bunches of profiles and different temporal distributions to basically get your big total number into each and every of your little grid cells. Um, the opposite way is that you have no idea about how much is emitted, but you have a pretty good idea about the sources. And then you just come from each source and estimate each source. And here's an example for that. That's the uh, shipping anti-collision AIS system. So you get a global coverage like every five minutes of every major ship, with the exception of those Russian Black Fleet oil tankers that turn it off. And then you actually can get a, a, the data for every oil tanker in the world. How big is it? How heavy is it? What engine does it have? When was it last rehauled? What, what kind of fuel does it use? And you basically model every single ship, and then equally you end up with an emission map. I tend to forget breathing. <sighs> you need a break? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Stay with me. Um, let me just give you a little example. That's just uh, what popped up when... Uh, it, it's basically just an emission map for vehicle emissions in Germany for different road types. And the total emission, there's the same amount of stuff emitted in Germany, but you, you can also see that they look similar, but definitely different. You can see fancy artifacts and some strange things in the top down, which shows you that you're interpolated. Um, and you can see much more detail in this, this detailed uh, model down there, where basically there have been cars and destinations and people driving on actual roads. And um, yeah, that's maybe the first, first time to complain. Um, so you, you model these cars, and then of course one thing is, you have an emission factor. So, like, look here, 0.2 grams of NO2 per kilometer. And, I mean, for a few years, all the modelers knew that we have to multiply our uh, vehicle emissions with some factor, at least two or three. And 
then no one was really surprised when it came out that the emission factors weren't right, because actually models do work. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. I mean, they say everyone believes the measurement besides the person who did it. No one believes the model besides the model. And um, yeah, trust me. And having now this, this monster of an emission model with all these sources and species, we can not only have things transported, we actually can have stuff transported. That's from our colleagues in Karlsruhe, the KIT, and you can see some Saharan dust that's blown up, and here you can see a nice episode where actually the Saharan dust then is transported up to us. Um, but it's still not enough, remember? We wanted also things to happen, so we want chemistry and all our, our species and pollutants to react with each other. And um, <laughs> I mean, it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen. What, what people aren't aware is like how, how few of those air pollution molecules there actually are. We're talking about a few per million of air molecules. With some toxic substances, it goes even to billions. And so, what do we do? Martin said I couldn't do a complete atmospheric chemistry lecture, no one would like it, and we don't get two hours additionally. So um, we compromised on two really interesting examples, and I try to be quick and easily to follow. And we start with tropospheric ozone. So you think ozone, that's nice, we have it in the stratosphere, it takes out the UV, but we also have the tropospheric ozone. That's down here where we live and breath, and it's a completely different uh, mechanism. There's Basically, that's a simplified thing that tries to convey the message that you have two circles that interact. So you have these NO2 circles, and you have the big circle in the middle. And here you can just follow like this little, little VOC, how it's getting into the circle, and then it interacts. And now on the bottom you see, oh, the first time the circle went through, so we've produced some ozone. And the VOC happily continues, it hits the other cycle again, and in, in this way, the idea behind that is that it's a highly nonlinear process. Break one circle, the other doesn't matter. So, one industry in one location could be a huge problem for ozone. Take the same thing somewhere else, it doesn't matter, because uh, if you don't have one, it doesn't matter if you add the other. And then I stumbled uh, randomly about this picture on the internet, and I thought, I mean, it's nice. I like trees, but poplars are actually one of the highest VOC emitters, so I don't really see a nice tree. I see like a deadly chemical trap. No, wait, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Nah. <laughs> Boring sight is coming in, because actually we did some modeling studies on that, and uh, it really depends on where you are and when you are there. For example, in Hamburg and in the rhine ruhr area, the impact of plants on formating extra ozone is really low, like 2%. In Berlin, during a heat wave, there was an impact of up to 12% and sometimes even higher. But if you look at the general findings based on literature, you, you can see that it's really important what kind of tree you have. On the left, you have a tree that emits just a few VOCs, and on the right, a lot of VOCs. And then it also depends on the conditions you have. So if there are already a lot of VOCs, uh, compared to NOx, um, it's, it's really important how much there is. So if there are a, mud, a lot of these high VOCs and there are a lot of these trees that emit a lot of VOCs, there will be ozone formation. So just to jump in here. Yeah, yeah, maybe we still have chemistry to do. Yeah. So um, sorry for him interrupting, um, because now that, that's, the, that's really interesting. It's secondary particle formation. So. Isn't it thrilling, just the word? And um, basically what you have is that something is emitted as a gas, sticks around in the atmosphere, and once it meets another gas from a completely different source, they can actually build particles. And that's the example here with the ammonia on the one hand and the sulfur and nitrogen dioxides on the other. These are gases that get emitted. Let's say there's a ship emitting NO2, there's a cow emitting NH3, and the stuff oxidizes, and it basically turns into mini-magnets. And then it starts being transported with the atmosphere, and when they actually meet, 
the mini magnets will engage and you form particles. And um, that's really interesting. And I'll show you a nice video in a second to show how interesting it is. But um, with all the talk, I think I managed to go through three of our four models. So we have transport, we have like a metrological model, the physics and all the transport. We have an emission model that gives us all the stuff getting into atmosphere. And then we have the things reacting in the atmosphere. So I guess we can start with some interesting applications mm -hmm. that we did. Like randomly, we have this video. Um, and again, it shows how nice models are. So here, basically, you run the model with everything. And then you add a source or remove a source. And by looking at the differences between your runs, here we have the secondary particles formed from ship emissions. So it's only the emissions from ships. And so in the English Channel, you will have all the NO2 going into the atmosphere. And when the wind gets it over the, the coastline, it reacts with the ammonia. And then you can get these nice blobs. And that's a specialty of the PM2.5, because it's so small, it's, too, it's not heavy enough. It doesn't fall down. So these blobs basically persist until they hit the rain. And if it doesn't rain, it will just stay there. And oh, a seven microgram blob just went over Hamburg. That's already like half the limit value. That also shows you that on a given day, a source far away might ruin your air quality. Nothing you can do. And another thing with these particles is that, especially with all those diesel vehicles, a uh, discussion was really strong about there's the particles, there's too much NO2 coming from the vehicles. And then with uh, a student, Anna, a few years ago, we thought, yeah, but what about if we remove the ammonia instead of the NO2? And basically, you just see on the left side a map for Europe with the secondary particles in our standard prediction what it should be. And then we we didn't even make people vegetarians. We used some World Health Organization diet with reduced food consumption and uh, meat consumption. And yeah, just having less manure and animal husbandry, some areas really halved the particles already. That was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you have some examples? Yes. Actually, I would like to catch up on what you introduced um, about the advantages of modeling. Because, uh, as, as you said, there is the chance that we can do source apportionment. And we did a little study here for Hamburg in 2012, and you can see the total PM2.5 concentration on the left. And on the first side, you see some hotspots there. But the question is now, where is it coming from? So what are the responsible emission sources? And on the right, you see industry, residential heating, ships, and traffic with all their relative contribution to that. And this is something you can easily do with models. Um, in this case, you can see that for traffic, for example, we have a, a big problem, like everywhere. <clears throat> then when it comes to ships and industry, it focuses on specific reasons, and this, maybe you keep that in mind for a while. Um, and what we also can do with models, as you introduced, uh, we can do future scenarios. So uh, I know 2020 isn't the future anymore, but at that point where we did this study, that was in 2018, it was published then in 2020. So um, this was still the future, and we made some prognosis with scenarios, what happens in 2020, and modeled it. And then if you do the difference of these, you can see what's, what's the impact, where is the biggest impact, what are the sources where we can really tr start to, to regulate. And you see again, it's traffic. So then, um, there have been some traffic bans in Hamburg, maybe some of you know, maybe some of you can remember. And I, um, yeah, these are two streets here in Hamburg where I have been banned for diesel trucks and banned for diesel cars. And if you exclude some specific trucks or cars from these roads to reduce the measured concentration, then it might appear that you don't have a problem anymore. But if you would have run a model, you would have seen that the air pollution would just have shifted to other regions. So it's really a question how useful are such, such measures in the entire perspective of a city. Okay, still alive? Okay, good. Um, and yeah, we can clearly identify such, such, such things with models. It doesn't um, narrow down the effect that happened there. Of course, the concentration went down. Um, 
What's going on? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Um, coming to an actual idea for a scenario we can model, we do often and we like to do some maximum impact scenarios. For example here, what would happen if we would uh, introduce only electric cars um, in the inner city of Hamburg? And also, we fire them with coal, so the dirtiest source of energy we know right now, but still, what would happen if we would do it? And you could see that even if we, in the year 2020, would have exchanged all the cars in the inner city by electric cars, there would have been substantial reductions of NO2, up to minus 20 microgram per cubic meter, and actually that's the uh, existing limit value right now. So this would have a really nice impact. And the higher emissions from power plants, at that point there was still the, the power plant in Moorburg active, right now it's not anymore, but like the impact of additional energy to power all these cars was very small, so we are talking here about ranges of 0 to 2 micrograms per cubic meter. So also very nice model application. And what we did in the last years, we um, created an urban air quality forecast for the city of Hamburg. So up there is the URL, you can all look it up on your iPhone, it's public, and it's based on all the measurements, uh, all the models you introduced. Um, so it's really based on science we are doing on a daily basis, and it's improved all the time, but it's still very ugly. So <laughs> if some, some of you here might help us with making it a bit nicer, I would, happy, would be happy to talk to you after the talk. Yeah, who thinks that scientists make beautiful products? No. I don't get it. No, mm. and we're also not good talking to people. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I think we now have the full chain of modeling system, the air quality numerical modeling system, almost, because we still have to talk about the exposure. So, what is exposure? Um, basically, that's the amount of air pollutant concentrations that you are breathing. So, we are here in the middle. We have now our air quality modeling system, and now we want to know what are the health effects. And there's a step in between, that's the exposure. And I really love this topic because it's sometimes it's so simple and then also so there are so many impacts. Um, so what we actually do is shown here on the left and it involves some things that are not happening at home. So we are not at home all the time, we go out, we are at the communication congress, we are on our bikes, we are doing whatever, inside, outside, different locations. But the problems with the established exposure assessments is that they think we are doing this. So they basically assume that we are living on our roofs or at our windows all the time. Every day, every hour of our lives. And based on this assumption, health effects coming from air pollutants are calculated. And I'm pretty sure that each of you now understood already that there's probably a big uncertainty and bias in it because that's simply just not true. But of course, there are scientific methods to tackle this problem. And um, on the left, you can see again this, this distinction between a static individual staying at home all the time, but the concentration changes every hour, and on the right, you have this mobile individual that moves through the city. So we can identify the, all these areas in the city and the concentrations, but it really doesn't help if we, get, if we don't get the population activity right. So where are you and when? And there are, of course, measurements you can use. You can use mobile phone data, agent-based modeling, but there's also something that's called the time microenvironment activity approach. It sounds really aggressive, I would say, because it's whatever. Um, but it's, it's easy, it's simple, and it's nice. I really like to use it. So the idea behind that is you classify uniform areas in a city. You say these are work environments, these are home environments, these are transport environments. And then you can go and say, okay, where are these environments? Then you use satellite products, for example, the Copernicus Urban Atlas. You have satellite images, they are produced then to land use data, and then you can just cluster them and map your environment. So you really know where are all these environments in any region you can imagine in Europe. And there are also some other projects for um, other countries in the world, of course. What you then do is you do some temporal mapping. So it's basically a bit like emission modeling, but with the population. So you know a certain fraction of the population is at work right now, at a specific uh, time during the day, so, or in traffic, or at home, or wherever. And you can also focus it on specific groups of population and so on. So you just combine this information, and on top you also have the chance 
to take into account the infiltration of the concentrations that are outside to indoor environments based on these clusters you defined. So you have measurements that tell you only 90% is coming in and you can take this value and combine it. And then you combine all of this and you get a dynamic population. Instead of assuming that we are at home all the time, we now have some dynamics. And if we compare this now with the static assumption that we are at home all the time, um, we did again for Hamburg because we just love Hamburg and we are close to Hamburg, so we just do everything we do for Hamburg as a test case. Um, you see here in green residential areas. These are areas in Hamburg where people live. And in red, these are areas where not that many people live. It depends on what data you're using. Um, the green shows now um, um, a reduction. So that means we move the people away from the green areas to the red areas. And all these red areas have not been considered before. And if you remember, I showed you the source apportionment before. Like These areas are the highly polluted areas in Hamburg. So there's industry and there's shipping. So it's really important to take into account that people are working there, that they are in transport, and so on. So we can imagine that this will have an impact on the overall exposure. And actually, we did many, many studies in Europe in different cities to identify what's the signal here, what's the bias, what are we underestimating. And it's a really a significant city signal in many urban areas. So we have up to 13% higher NO2, 21% higher PM2.5. And more recently, we did a study to tackle this dynamic problem for all um, the European 27 countries, and we also saw a signal there that it will be underestimated. And if you now think about that, the, um, the EEA, the European Environment Agency, calculates the exposure and based on that the health effects, and that they say each year 600,000 people die earlier, so premature deaths, because of um, air pollution, and you add these 5 and 3%, probably the health effects are worse than we, when, than we know right now. So I think it's really important, but also very easy to take this into account. And there was a great, um, nah, I should call it great, but for a scientist it was kind of great, this pandemic situation, because um, it was a real, real world experiment. So there was a lot of data collected during it, and we had some kind of a baseline and, and the difference. So we now no, because Google and Apple, they collected a lot of data and we used this data to, to identify what's the impact of changing activities on emissions and air quality. And then eventually exposure. So people were less at uh, work, more at home, they were less in transport. This all has effects on emissions and many, many studies identified that the concentrations went down. But uh, there were just very few studies that also took a look at the exposure. So how many were we exposed to, how much were we exposed to? And we did this, and of course, when you are not assuming that people are still at the same locations as they were before the pandemic, the exposure goes even lower. So we are happy that this kind of data exists and that we can use it, and we are pretty sure that there will be more of these nice data sets that we can use to improve our emissions, that we can use to improve our exposure, and so on. And with that, um, we have to come slowly to an end. And this is your part. My yeah. mic working? Oh. Yeah, um, we're slowly approaching our destination. The cryostatic sleeping chambers will be deactivated soon. Um, you might have noticed we really would have liked to keep talking. And we can lock the doors, so there's no way out. But um, the thing is, I guess we could give you an overview of what the thing is, this air and this pollution, and what kind of models we use. So. For last but not least, it's where are we doing that actually? And um, so you can run these models on a workstation. So I, I mean, I know PhDs that got a workstation and can do simulations there, but we're approaching a point where really you need, especially if you want longer time scales, you want to do scenarios and go now higher resolutions, a global coverage, I like to call it local. Mm. because there used to be this modeling community on the high resolution scale and this global people and with the computational capacities, capabilities, it's really uh, basically becoming one where we can model globally with high resolutions. And um, it's actually one thing that's a bit special about all this, this um, climate and chemistry modeling is that it's huge. We, we can have a domain with a million grid cells and then we have tens, hundreds of variables, 
And um, it just means we have uh, crazy uh, requirements concerning the data. <laughs> um, so we can, in theory, calculate our stuff on any HPC machine, but uh, that's a really nice thing that um, here in Hamburg we have, uh, that comes on the next slide, we have the, the Levante system. Yeah, let me go there. Um, that's, that's a supercomputer here in Hamburg. It's the German climate computing system where our institute is one of the shareholders. And I just checked, we are 74 on the top 500 list. But um, it's, as I said, not about the, the computational power, it's really about the, the space, so you easily feel like 30, 50 terabyte with a year worth of data, and then you might have 10 or 50, and so it gets really huge, and uh, our system is actually slowly approaching the exabyte. I'm always waiting when I get prompt with like an EB, because the PB is still confusing me, and I don't know, but that's something I just want to mention. Why is there no 16-bit floating point in, in data formats like NetCDF? I, I get the suspicion that half of the disk space is just filled with insignificant digits. Um, but then no one wants to interpolate on some integer uh, value and have an, an, a scaling factor or stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that's what we're doing. We're calculating uh, and using up space and energy and hope that we produce less air pollution than we uh, prevent with our work. And um, <laughs> that's... <laughs> that's <laughs> We could model that. No? <laughs> yeah, we should be there in 10 years. No? <laughs> um, yeah, with that, just so I hope what you got away is that there's a quite interesting multidisciplinary topic that covers all kinds of natural science and computer science, but also has strong links to social science and policy making. And um, that is actually relevant. And Although people aren't that afraid of breathing the air, like, for example, some people flying, it's, it's what probably will kill you. <laughs> and um, what's now happening is that, I mean, we're just wondering that there was no talk about this subject at all. We saw there's something on climate models, but these air pollution models, there, there has been really a development over the last 20 years that these things are now really getting to a point where you will probably are already starting to be confronted with that. And I mean, may it be that you're an allergic person and you get your pollen forecast, or um, that maybe you benefit that an urban development planning project was based on, on a model study. Um, I'm just very positive that these things that are now moving towards Earth system models, we don't only have the atmosphere, but we have the ocean, we have ecosystems, uh, we, we have even a model where we have like fish and um, so actually we were coming to a point where we have like a digital twin of the complete earth system where we can track pollutants, where are they going, where are they coming from, and can I go outside of my house tomorrow? With that, thanks for sticking with us. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Uh, well, we, we have a big problem. Um, I think really? we, we didn't mention it. Yeah, we are, we are no uh, computer scientists. So oh, <laughs> we, yeah. we apply all of these models on supercomputers, but uh, sometimes it's hard. And uh, yeah, we, can, we, we need people like you to support us. And we also try to help people entering this topic. So, for example, we did a little hackathon here in 2023. And uh, except of us, these are all people who measure stuff, so they have no clue about modeling. And we try to explain how to build a model, how to run a model on a HPC. And yeah, um, I think with this. That was fun. That was fun, yeah. So, but now uh, we are really done. This is our literature. Please ask questions. Thank you, Martin Ramacher, and thank you, Johannes Bieser. Um, if you have questions, please queue up at the microphones. Um, and also, we take questions from the internet. I would start with the signal angel. The internet is asking about two sources of pollution. What about vehicle tires, and what about if we all switch to hydrogen and there's ammonia everywhere? How, does, how do you see that impacting the world? 
Yeah, actually, that was the reason why I just showed um, results for NO2 concentrations, because, for example, when you introduce electric cars or hybrid electric vehicles, you, you will still have tire wear, you will have um, particles from braking, from the tires themselves, so by introducing electric cars, we will only partially tackling the problem of particulate mm -hmm. matter pollution. So. I think that answers the question. Yeah, and it's especially that tire and uh, uh, brake wear is, I mean, there are estimates in the emission models, so we have some factors for different, depending on the size and weight of cars, but these are really, really uncertain, and it's still a big question mark. Thank you. Uh, microphone number two, your question. Hello. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for a great talk, talk very interesting one. Uh, my question is, when it comes to modeling air pollution in Germany, one of the biggest topics is the shutting down of nuclear power plants and then dependence on gas and then shutting down of gas pipelines and depending on coal. Have you done or have you experimented with any modeling around like reintroducing nuclear power plants and how it would influence the air pollution in the current climate where the gas doesn't flow that much anymore? So that's, that's not a study we've done. Um, let me think a second before I say silly things. But um, no, we didn't it's, it. it's just that, I mean, of course, I mean, coal-fired power plants, it's the, it's the most polluting thing. I mean, it, it emits more radioactivity than a nuclear power plant because of the cesium in there. And um, it is definitely pollution-wise a not wise decision. Um, but I, it's nothing that would affect the German air quality because the, the coal-fired power plants, it's, it's really the, the sulfur and there uh, we've had reductions of like 98% because all the uh, coal-fired power plants now have sulfur uh, uh, desulfurization, so they, they reduce it before it gets out of the thing. So the coal is really a climate thing with the CO2 mainly, but it, it, it shouldn't be like a significant part of what what's actually polluting you, that's much more from traffic, agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Signal, enjoy your question. Uh, the community is asking, how, about, how are the models impacted by different measurement choices? Is it better to buy like one very good measurement station or many small DIY almost ones? And can people get involved helping with that? That's actually a good question, and uh, the answer is we need everything in the end, because it's really important to have these reference-grade uh, instruments, which are really expensive. Uh, you can use these to calibrate your, your small DIY sensors, so you get an idea on how they perform and how well they perform, and then you can distribute them spatially, so you get a better idea of, of the spatial coverage, but still there are gaps in between, and then modeling comes into play. So if everything works together and interacts together nicely, yeah. then we get a really good picture of what's actually going on, because as Visa said, um, sometimes it's hard to trust models, but it's also hard to trust measurements. So we need, in the end, we need everything, and I think we can brainstorm about possibilities how to work together, yeah? Sure. Thank you. Microphone number one, what is your question? Hi. By distributing the sensors, um, you get a really good real-time model, I think. Is there any researches regarding the blobs, you call them blobs, I think, uh, how to catch them or how to clean them up? Because if they are in metropoles, maybe there is a technique to, to work with them, so you can collect the trash from floor, but maybe you can collect also some trash from air. Uh, with the blobs, you mean the, the ship emission particle video? Yeah, but more in the metropoles, not on the ocean. Um, yeah, what's happening is that there's now, um, I mean, it started that, uh, so let me, let me start, it's really crazy. Ships, they, they drive with heavy fuel oil mostly. And oil, it's trick, it's, it's basically at room temperature, it's not liquid. They, they drive with a solid and it's full with sulfur especially. But um, a few years ago, the, uh, the World Maritime Organization started introducing sulfur reduction areas where you're not allowed anymore to drive with sulfur content. And now, actually, is that, that's upcoming, that's not there yet. There's now the nitrogen emission areas where ships will be forced to actually switch onto a liquefied nitrogen gas. And that's a super interesting topic because uh, having the sulfur emissions away from people, that's really good. 
But if we now use the desulfurized fuel, that also means we're not emitting sulfur above the Atlantic, above the Pacific. And there's this super effective coolant as a, as a particle. So, um, yeah, because that's, that's really something that's, again, from the policy perspective, a bit, it's, I think it's crazy. You have these, these areas, and they are, I don't know how many miles away from the coastline, but then there's a point when you exit this, this coastline, this area, you can, again, just burn whatever you want. So the regulation is just valid when you're close mm -hmm. to the coast, and this is, mm -hmm. as, you, as you saw, that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. because the formation happens also mm -hmm. far away from the coast and inland. But in the opposite way that you have something like a smoking room where they clean the air, so you have an area where you can create some pollution, which is not, it should not be our future, but, um, and then they have some technique to clean them. Yeah, but I mean, you're, you're completely helpless. It gets, it gets transported with the winds and diffusion, and so you could have some fancy artificial trees everywhere. I mean, it's, it's really, if there wouldn't be that massive amount of manure and ammonia emissions from the animal husbandry, and for the nitrogen oxides, it's really mostly the uh, vehicle's traffic. So if, if your cloud plume from the ship comes on coast, and there is no pig farm, then also there would probably be less particles produced. Hmm. Thank you for your answer. Uh, microphone number two, your question. Hello, thank you for your interesting talk. I also had one of those sensors in operation that you mentioned yeah, that yeah. Uh, measure um, PM2 and um, PM10, uh, 2.5 and PM10. And um, what I saw in my data was also the traffic patterns that you mentioned. It was very clear, but um, what I also saw was um, the high peak at the end of the year coming from the fireworks. Mm -hmm. And I would um, um, ask you, um, what is your position on a um, ban of fireworks? Do you have any opinion on that? And uh, given your knowledge also, of course. I, I have a personal opinion on that, and I, I don't like it. I would ban it. <laughs> <laughs> um, from an air quality pr perspective and emission modeling perspective, it's really interesting because we just don't take it into account. So whenever we, we model the January and the 1st of January and also the 31st of the, of the, the last of the year, then we also always have this peak in our models, when we, uh, not in our models, but in the measurements. And when we compare it, we always we are far away from it because we just don't take into account. Because we are using these temporal profiles to distribute emissions, but such things as holidays and special occasions or like 500,000 people meeting to grill in the park or whatever, it's just not in our models because it's so specific that we can't model it in general. Well, of course you can do it, you can do a specific study about it, but if you look at the whole city or country or even the world, then such events just disappear. Um, yeah, so no, it's not in our model. Yeah. And it's also very bad for cities that are shaped like a pit, like, like Hassel or yes. Stuttgart mm -hmm. and so Definitely, on. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah we you. didn't talk about oreography, yeah. Thank you for your answer. My phone number three, your question. Hi, so if you spend a lot of time online, you quickly read about this new class of pollutants, the perfluorinated alkyl substances, or the PFAS. Ah, and I was you. wondering if that is relevant at all to your research in air pollution, or if it's rather on the turf of water pollution, and if it's relevant, if you already have the ability to measure and model them. Actually, we are running a little group who's dealing with this topic. Uh, so we, we have... Um, Did you pay him to ask the question? No, I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so as, as we were introduced, we are pollution modelers. So we are not focusing only on air pollution. We are looking at many pollutants, and not only in the atmosphere, but also in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, so for, for PFAS, we actually uh, published a global emission model for PFAS into rivers, oceans, and atmosphere that covers the whole production period from the 1950s to uh, 2020 that's available in this ECHAT database where there is uh, also the IPCC emission um, databases are. And I really love the PFAS topic because as modelers, it's always like the initial condition. What's the initial condition? And we just thought 1950, the substance didn't exist. It's like, 
I have an initial condition that thought it would never happen. I can die happy now. And um, we, we are actually just, uh, we have two PhD students we're supervising, and one is working on the atmospheric icon model and the other on the, the ocean icon model, and we're just um, kicking them not to have vacation and finish the model space. No, no, we're nice supervisors. And, um, uh, so, but yes, we were actually working on having an atmosphere ocean coupled model where we can also look at things like because there are acids once they're in the ocean they shouldn't come back, but then you can have sea spray and it actually when the sea spray evaporates you have a mechanism of getting it wind driven back into the atmosphere that's probably a, a factor in the long range transport and now there's like new European regulations coming up that bans like 24 PFAS and so. Just to add one more thing, because we also do measurements on mainly in water, but also some in the atmosphere. And there are some other groups around the world that are doing that too. So actually, that's a big problem with on, the, on the agenda for measurements and modeling. And yeah, we're on it. Thank you for your answer. Uh, I'm afraid time's up. Are you still around for people to contact you for, for further questions? Yes. Awesome. You never Please. stop talking. <laughs> 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 Ken. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you.